I'm director of Ohio Sea Grant and Ohio State University Stone Laboratory, but in this capacity, also uh, executive director of LEARN, which you'll learn about here today in a little bit more detail. Um, but it's my pleasure to introduce what is uh, the second um, uh, event um, of the H2 Ohio Wetland Monitoring Program. So this isn't an annual event. This is an annual event. This, as I said, is the second one. And we, we plan on repeating this webinar every year to update folks on how things are going and where things are, are moving. And so it's my absolute pleasure um, to introduce Dr. Lauren Kinsman Costello, the research lead for this um, H2O Wetland Monitoring Program. Um, I will be monitoring uh, the chat function as we come in, but we will address all questions at the end. <clears throat> We also had questions that were submitted during registration. So I will be balancing the questions that were submitted prior to the webinar um, that weren't perhaps addressed by, by this presentation and also we'll take questions that come in during the presentation. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Kinsman Costello. Thanks, Chris. Thanks so much to everybody logging into the webinar. It's great to see some familiar names on the participant list. I'm excited to share an update on our monitoring program with you all. Um, so just to give a quick overview of what I'm gonna talk about in this webinar today, um, it's specifically about the wetland monitoring program. So the part of the H2 Ohio wetland restoration program specifically focused on monitoring the wetland project. So I'll talk a little bit about our goals, uh, the background of the program, how we got to where we are today, um, broadly how we've structured the program, some select examples of data collection and monitoring approaches. Um, we won't go over an exhaustive list of all of the data that we collect in all of the places that we collect it, um, but that would be available for anybody who is interested. Um, and then kind of an overview of our progress to date and plans going forward. All right, so as I mentioned, um, this will be specifically about the portion of the H2 Ohio initiative that's being implemented by the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. Um, so this is a statewide program aimed at improving Ohio's water quality. Um, and the ODNR is specifically, specifically in charge of implementing natural infrastructure, which mostly is in the form of wetland ecosystems. To date, since the program started in about 2020, they have uh, implemented a really impressive amount and diversity of wetland restoration projects. So to date, there's 113 projects under contract, um, many of which I think about 25 have already been completed. Um, over $92 million invested in wetland restoration. Um, the projects are really diverse working with so many conservation partners throughout the state, at least 45 distinct groups. Um, and it's implemented by Eric Soss and Rachel Denauer, who are both with the ODNR. Um, and they are the individuals who coordinate the selection of projects and the funding of projects and have basically shared with us their priorities for monitoring these projects. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, the ODNR has allocated a very healthy portion of their budget to establish an independent monitoring program to understand the effectiveness of the wetland restoration projects that they are implementing. Um, and in order to do that, they've contracted with members of LEARN, the Lake Erie and Aquatic Research Network, which is uh, a large and broad consortium of researchers throughout the state of Ohio and elsewhere that study Lake Erie and other aquatic ecosystems. And Chris is going to give a little bit more information about the broader LEARN network at the end of this webinar. Um, the H2 Ohio Wetland Monitoring Program, which I'm going to tell you about today, is one um, project within LEARN that is implemented by several of the LEARN scientists. So just to give a brief overview before I dive into details about how we got to where we are now um, and kind of the timeline, it's hard to believe, feels both like 
this has been a really quick timeline and also that we've been working on this for quite a while now. So the H2 Ohio initiative was launched in 2019, soon after Governor Mike DeWine was elected. And in 2020, we began to establish the wetland monitoring program. At that time, the ODNR gave us a list of 25 restoration or 26 restoration projects that were under contract um, that we looked at and thought about as we began developing protocols and thinking about the best approaches to assess the nutrient removal of this diversity of projects. By 2021, we were working on developing our protocols and collecting some preliminary data, um, and then there were 68 projects on the ODNR's list. This year, um, even this number on this graphic is out of date. Now the ODNR has 113 total projects under contract. We've completed our first year of routine monitoring in about 19 of the projects that have been completed. And of course, we're aiming to continue this monitoring, synthesize the data that we've begun to collect, and continue to refine our monitoring monitoring approaches. Before I go on and tell you more details about the program, um, I just want to acknowledge essentially my co-authors on this presentation. So the faces you're seeing here are the very diverse um, interdisciplinary leaders of what we call the wetlands and water quality team within LEARN. Um, most of us are faculty. We represent uh, six universities throughout the state of Ohio. Um, wetlands are really complex systems. We have to understand a lot of different features of them to understand their biogeochemistry and their nutrient function. And so we have a team of really diverse expertise, including hydrologists, modelers, soil scientists, plant ecologists, um, nutrient biogeochemists, people with rich expertise in developing and implementing monitoring programs. Um, I don't have time to verbally acknowledge each and every individual here, but just know that even in addition to these faces, we have a really, really strong pretty large and diverse team. I do have to specially acknowledge the three specific individuals highlighted here. Um, Nicole Wright, Olivia Johnson, and Haisa Mendoza are our administrative coordinator, research coordinator, and chief data manager. Literally, this program would not run without them. They coordinate each and every aspect of all of the activities that I'm going to tell you about here, and they deserve really special recognition for their critical role in implementing this program. Okay. So my guess is that a lot of people who have chosen to log into a public webinar about an update on the H2 Ohio Wetlands Monitoring Program have at least heard the phrase that wetlands are the kidneys of the landscape. And many of you have probably heard me tell the joke already that sometimes they're even shaped like kidneys, as in the image you see here of the Olentangy Wetland Research Center at The Ohio State University. Um, and this is true, we, we often call wetlands the kidneys of the landscape because they tend to have a natural capacity to filter water um, and clean up pollution. But there's a couple of really important caveats to this generality, and that's that the ability of wetlands to remove pollution varies um, from one wetland to the next. Even different locations within a wetland can have different pollution removal capacities. Um, and wetlands certainly change through time, especially brand new restored ecosystems that are still establishing. Sometimes wetlands can even be a nutrient source rather than a sink, especially when they're restored on lands that contain legacy phosphorus, perhaps from the use of fertilizer for cultivation in the past. Um, and although we're really interested in mitigating both nitrogen and phosphorus, because we know that both of these nutrients play important roles in driving the size and toxicity of harmful algal blooms in the Western Basin of Lake Erie, in other freshwater ecosystems throughout the state of Ohio, and in ecosystems um, throughout the country, there are some really important differences in nitrogen and phosphorus that mean that some wetlands might not be very effective at treating both to the same capacity. So the vast majority of existing large-scale multi-wetland monitoring and assessment programs that are aimed at assessing regulatory compliance or contractual performance for individual projects 
um, or maybe at larger scales, things like wetland ecosystem health and integrity and um, even habitat quality. Um, these are often based on structural features that can be relatively easily directly observed. Things like plant biodiversity, substrate characteristics, you know, all the defining features that are looked for in wetland delineations, hydric soils, wetland vegetation, um, you know, indicators of hydro period, um, basically determining does it look like a wetland? Is the structure of the wetland there? And along with that is an assumption that these structural wetland features reflect these functions of nutrient removal that are by and large invisible to our eyes. And also embedded within a lot of the monitoring frameworks that we have, there are some long, really good long-term monitoring programs in place, but many, um, lots of wetland monitoring occurs over relatively short timescales, which assumes kind of a sta stability in the system. When we know, we can look outside and see that ecosystems change and they're naturally dynamic. Again, especially newly restored ecosystems. So given that our main goal as a part of the H2 Ohio initiative is to improve specifically nutrient loads to aquatic systems, in order to assess the role that wetlands are playing in that, our objective for the H2 Ohio Wetland Monitoring Program is to directly assess both the nitrogen and phosphorus nutrient removal function of wetland projects being implemented by the ODNR. Now, this is really challenging. Making these invisible processes visible um, does take a lot of hard work. But we hope that the information we provide is going to support both evaluation of the restoration program as a whole, and that it's also going to help inform future restoration activities, guide management, and maybe shape policies in the future. We want to be really clear that we are not monitoring individual wetland projects for any kind of compliance or um, contractual performance. We know that each and every one of these dots on the map is being designed and implemented and constructed with the best available science by experts in wetland restoration and management in the field. We're looking at this with more of a scientific lens and a programmatic lens um, to better understand how the ODNR can make effective use of the resources and wetland managers throughout the Great Lakes. Okay, if we're going to assess how or whether or not wetlands remove nutrients, it's important to understand at least the basics. So welcome to Dr. Kinsman Costello's biogeochemistry class. Um, I'll give you a little bit of an overview on the major ways that wetlands remove nutrients. So when nitrogen and phosphorus enters a wetland, perhaps the most conspicuous way that the wetland sucks it up is through plants, right? Any gardener knows this. Um, nitrogen and phosphorus are critical building blocks. Every living thing needs them to grow, including plants. So plants take up some of the nitrogen and phosphorus that goes into the wetland and stores it in their tissue. But sometimes these plants die, and then through the process of decomposition, the nutrients can be re-released into the wetland. So although this is a really conspicuous and potentially powerful mechanism for at least slowing nutrients down and maybe putting them in a less available form, it's not a permanent removal. And arguably, it probably doesn't remove most of the nutrients entering the wetland anyway. To get at the more permanent and higher magnitude removal mechanisms, we have to look in the soils. Um, and this is where the differences between nitrogen and phosphorus get important and where the biogeochemists get excited. Uh, so nitrogen, when available forms of nitrogen get into the soil, the flooded, anaerobic, no oxygen soil in wetlands, microbes in that soil basically breathe a form of nitrate instead of oxygen. And in the process of denitrification, they change the available nitrogen into an unavailable nitrogen gas. So this totally removes nitrogen from the system. It's not moving downstream. It's not even in the system anymore to provide nutrients for growth within the system. Phosphorus, on the other hand, doesn't have a major gaseous component. So the only ways that wetlands have of stopping phosphorus from moving further downstream is by doing that, stopping and storing it. 
So the phosphate ion, which is the kind of phosphorus that plants and algae can take up, is actually a very chemically sticky ion. It tends to stick to soil particles and minerals. So soils can prevent phosphorus from moving downstream through the sorption processes. And also any particles that have phosphate stuck to them or bound in them may settle uh, in the slower moving waters of a wetland and be buried. So that's how wetlands tend to remove phosphorus. One really important thing to keep in mind once we know these basic removal mechanisms is that the rates, the sizes of these arrows are extremely variable both within a wetland in different spots, um, across from one wetland to the next, and even within a single wetland over time. Um, so we can't take a single soil sample from one spot in a wetland and necessarily assume that the rates of whatever is occurring in that soil, denitrification or phosphorus variable, applies to the entire system or to a different kind of wetland somewhere else. The other very important feature when we zoom out at higher scales and think about the roles that wetland ecosystems are playing in watersheds is that the ability of the whole system to take nutrients out of inflowing waters and prevent them from moving downstream depends on what kind of inflowing waters they're getting. So in this cartoon here is a, a example of a wetland that's not connected to this, maybe it's a tile drain um, with, with some high nutrient concentrations. Um, and so it doesn't even have the opportunity. It doesn't matter how effective it, that wetland ecosystem itself is at denitrification or phosphorus sorption. Um, if it's not connected to nutrient sources, it can't remove nutrients from those sources. So these are two really important things that we keep in mind while we are thinking about how best to assess the nutrient removal of wetland ecosystems. There's a lot of different ways to directly assess this removal, but what I alluded to earlier is that we are going to take a nutrient budgeting approach. Nutrient budgeting is really similar to, you can think about it like budgeting for your own bank account. So we can take a wetland and try to measure everything that goes in and measure everything that goes out um, in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus um, and do some math to understand what the net balance is. In this case, just like in your bank account, you want less nutrients leaving or less money leaving than entering. Um, this is a, we kind of think of this as the holy grail of ecosystem science in this context um, because it can generate an actual number of load reduction, for example, in grams or some weight removed per acre per year. Once you have it on that removal rate per acre per year, that supports more direct cost benefit analysis from one wetland to the next with other um, best management practices that may be implemented and invested in on the landscape. And it's based on a really policy relevant outcome, which is what proportion of nutrient load reduction are wetlands contributing to along with the other practices that are being implemented at various costs. There's some challenges to this, even though this is the most valuable kind of data we can collect. One is that it's really pretty resource intensive. So we can imagine a flow through wetland with um, an inflow and an outflow where we can measure the amount of water entering and leaving the wetland at those two places. We can take samples of the water and measure the amount of nutrients in it, do some simple math and create that budget. There's complexities in terms of making sure you're sampling enough water and sampling at the right times, but it's at least straightforward. There's lots of other kind of wetlands though, where these kinds of monitorable inflows and outflows don't really exist that pose different kinds of challenges. So for example, coastal wetlands um, might have bi-directional connections to places like Lake Erie and maybe influenced by seiches. So understanding the directionality of the water is important. Um, floodplain wetlands that are adjacent to larger water bodies, especially large rivers that may be intermittently flooded um, and then disconnected from the river, also don't have these kinds of easily monitorable inflows and outflows. And then finally, there are lots of wetlands that don't have any obvious surface water connection. There aren't pipes flowing in or streams flowing in and out. Um, they may be receiving surface water runoff and may have complicated and difficult to measure connections with groundwater. Um, and the groundwater piece actually might apply throughout. 
So because of this, we are taking more than just what's often called a black box approach, where we try to measure everything that goes in and everything that goes out and ignore what happens in the middle of the wetland. Um, we also need to understand the plants and how much nutrients they store. Um, we need to understand groundwater connections. We need to understand the processes of exchange of nutrients between soil and water. So by monitoring these components within the system and understanding the mechanisms that are occurring in these components, we can estimate nutrient budgets for the whole system by breaking it down into its parts and then putting the pieces back together. This also refines our understanding of processes in different kinds of wetlands, which supports mechanistic modeling that can then inform how we design and manage wetlands in the future um, and can also inform our understanding of wetlands that we just don't have the capacity to directly take samples in and measure um, because at a certain point you can't collect water samples at every wetland in Ohio as much as we would love to. So the strength of our program is that we're trying to combine this nutrient budget budgeting with mechanistic studying approach. Um, there are challenges there because what does monitoring in a real, not cartoon wetland look like? The 113 projects being implemented by the ODNR are incredibly diverse. They're really realistic representation of the variety of wetland restoration approaches that are used to improve water quality. No scientist would design a study to answer the question of are wetlands effective at removing nutrients this way, um, just because of the diversity. But there's a real opportunity here to understand how real wetland restoration really affects nutrient removal um, as wetlands are actually restored. So just to give you kind of a snapshot of what monitoring actually looks like on the ground, we're going to go through a case study. I chose this project, it's the Forder Bridge floodplain, Forder Bridge floodplain reconnection in Paulding County in Crane Township. Um, not because it's better or worse than any specific project. It's one of the ones that was finished the earliest, and therefore we have enough preliminary data that I can share some early results with you. So the Forder Bridge floodplain reconnection is a 54 acre parcel that's owned and managed by the Black Swamp Conservancy. And you can see from this image that it's directly adjacent to the Maumee River. In January 2020, I mentioned this was one of the very first projects, it was one of those 26 on our first list, um, the contract with the ODNR was executed. And in September 2020, um, Oxbow River and Stream Restoration Incorporated, who designed and constructed this restoration, finalized their plans. And then restoration was completed in June 2021. So then 2021 was our preliminary sampling and characterization year for this project. Because each of these wetlands have unique structures and unique features, and some features are difficult to understand just from plans and designs and aerial photos alone. Um, we've built a year of preliminary sampling and understanding um, for each project we monitor so that we can optimize our sample collection in the future. So in 2021, we collected some water and soil samples and mapped the site as best we could and interviewed um, our partners, people familiar with the design of the project. And then we used all of that information to write a project specific monitoring plan. For each project, we write a specific monitoring plan that outlines when, where, and how often, and what we want to sample in that project to meet the overall goals for that project. And then over the past growing season, since this spring, um, we've been collecting data to implement that routine monitoring plan. So to tell you a bit about how it was restored, there was some planting and tile drain disruption in the area that looks like it was row crop. It was row crop. Um, but most of our focus is on the wetland restoration portions of the parcel. So you can see I've kind of made those brighter here. Uh, several different, about four different wetland complexes were restored, including um, the one on the south end, uh, treatment wetlands and stored along this intermittent stream that drains agricultural land. So there's a small agricultural watershed to the south of this site 
that drains via a tile drain outlet into this intermittent stream. Um, and then in addition to the wetland complexes that were installed, the engineers also recontoured some of the banks of the intermittent flows to reconnect them to the floodplain and installed some riffle grade control structures to mitigate erosion um, to best sort of keep the water in the wetlands as long as possible to maximize processing, but also prevent the loss of particles into the river, which would lead to a net nutrient loss. And again, it's adjacent to the Maumee River, it flows into the Maumee River, it is possible that sometimes some of these complexes will be collected, connected to the river at floodplain, although we don't have enough information yet to know how likely this is and how common it will be. When we go to design a monitoring plan for a site, we would love to have sort of a template. Early in our program, we were imagining that all of our wetlands would fall into maybe one of these four categories that I explained earlier. So what kind of wetland is Forder Bridge? Well, uh, we know that based on the design plans and the frequency with which it holds water, it seems like uh, one of the complexes near the river is actually relatively isolated from surface flow pads. Um, the complexes installed at the outlet of the tile drain are fairly clearly a flow through system, although we know now that this is a very intermittently flowing system. It's, it's very long parts of the year where there isn't any water in it. Um, some of them at times seem to be isolated, but might also be connected uh, to the intermittent flow like a floodplain wetland. And then I said earlier, we don't know the degree to which these some existing wetlands that were there prior to the restoration and the newly restored complexes actually connect to the Maumee River. So of the four kinds of wetlands that we imagined would be in our portfolio, um, this one project represents at least three and, and coastal is kind of the easiest one to slot things into or out of, so it's not that. So this is an interesting opportunity because it means that within individual projects we can learn a lot about these different hydrologically different kinds of wetlands um, by monitoring um, just one parcel. But it does create some challenges in terms of having to design monitoring on a case-by-case -case basis or a project-by-project -project basis and not having kind of a single cookbook for each one. Okay, so to coordinate the modeling monitoring, it takes a lot of different people and we have base field crews and specialty field crews that I'll explain um, in the case of Forder, the Forder Bridge site. So first I'll tell you about our base field crews. So each one of the universities that you see here, Kent State, University of Toledo, Bowling Green State, the National Center for Water Quality Research at Heidelberg University and Wright State University has a base field crew. And that field crew is responsible for planning and coordinating all of the monitoring at specific projects that are assigned geographically. Um, they are in charge of implementing the water and the soil sampling, implementing some basic sensor deployment and maintenance, um, basically anything that requires boots on the ground and geographically close boots on the ground and frequent visits. Um, although you'll know that even, you know, some of these are still pretty far away, even for the ones within the, their um, groups. Uh, base field crews are also responsible for doing the routine chemical analyses on water and soil samples following standardized protocols. The heart and soul of this whole program are our field and lab technicians. So the images that you see here are uh, current and past field and lab technicians that lead each one of these field crews. Um, and they are responsible for implementing all of the sampling, all of the coordination, the communication with other crews and with our coordinating team. So um, these individuals also deserve special um, acknowledgement for their critical contribution. So for the Forder Bridge floodplain project, because of its location in Northwest Ohio, um, Bowling Green State's team, Bob Midden's team is the base crew. This team was led by Chathiranga Senevarathna um, until this fall, and now Jenna Hunt and Corbin Cohart are working together to lead this team. 
Um, and they looked at this site and distinguished 18 individual locations to collect water samples about monthly whenever water is present. And in these and all of the water samples we collect, we measure basic physical chemical measurements like dissolved oxygen, pH, conductivity, and temperature. We measure total nitrogen and phosphorus on unfiltered samples. Um, and then on filtered samples, we measure soluble reactive phosphorus as an indicator of phosphate and ammonium and nitrate as indices of available nitrogen. In soil, so in this site, like the others, we are sampling soils in all of the wetland pools and some of the land adjacent to the pool boundaries to understand different kinds of soils. We're measuring total nitrogen and phosphorus in each soil sample to quantify the amount of nutrients that are just stored in the soil itself. And then we're also doing Malik 3 extractions for phosphorus, iron, and aluminum, which lets us calculate something called the soil phosphor absorption capacity, which is an indicator of the capacity of the soil to sorb phosphate. And I'll tell you more about that um, in a couple minutes. So this crew in 2021 got out to Forder Bridge and collected some water samples and some soil samples and has continued that in 2022. So I'm really excited that we have some preliminary data to share. Um, you might notice this little crystal up here, this pretty little cube, that is a grain of salt. So I just wanna share that all of the data I'm sharing here has gone through our preliminary quality control but it has not been published and we're still um, working on understanding what it means. I'm just sharing it with you here to give you an example of the kind of information that we have right now and what we're working towards. So first, just to show you some surface water data, um, this graph is just showing water depths at the places that had water in them when the field crews were taking samples during our preliminary site characterizations um, time in 2021. Um, you can see that it's variable. You can see that wetland complex three tends to have pools that are the deepest. Um, wetland complex four tends to hold water and wetland complex one tends to hold water maybe for a little longer than some of the other um, areas. You'll notice these differences in here also um, kind of mirror the variability in water chemistry. So the this graph is showing the total phosphorus concentration. So this would be the unfiltered total amount of phosphorus in the surface water collected at these points. Again, extremely variable. Um, and we think this variability is just because most of the time, each of these pools are functioning as disconnected pools and they're not connected um, unless there's a big storm event and an active flow happening. We're still working on understanding when and how often that happens. But just to look at this total phosphorus data, it varies from probably less than 50 micrograms per liter, which is high but not um, unreasonably high, all the way up to 0.5 milligrams per liter or 500 micrograms per liter, which is um, pretty high for a freshwater surface water system. Um, the black dots indicate the concentration in the adjacent Maumee River on the dates that these samples were collected. So that gives you another frame of reference where some of the pools in the system ha sometimes have higher TP concentrations than the Maumee River, um, and sometimes they have lower concentrations than the Maumee River. One uh, thing that you might really conspicuously notice in these graphs is the lack of a data point for the Southwest Tile Outlet. Um, this is one of the routine sample collection points, but this in 2021 um, and in 2022, we weren't able to time the sample collection dates with days or times when this tile drain is flowing. So this is something that for this site and other sites like it, we are going to develop mechanisms to either employ some autonomous water collection devices like ISCO samplers and or um, sensors or other surveillance systems that can alert field crews um, when it's time to capture a storm event or one of these hot moments that might have a disproportionate effect on how the wetland is functioning in terms of when it's receiving and potentially um, releasing water. 
All right, so that was the surface water data. Um, I'm also excited to share that we have some soil data from this site. Um, this is the soil phosphate sorption capacity indicator that I mentioned earlier. Sometimes it's just called soil phosphorus storage capacity, abbreviated SPSC. Um, the math, the way that this indicator is calculated is very conveniently results in numbers where anything that is less than zero, any number that is negative, indicates that the soil has a potential to release phosphorus, right? The phosphate sorbed to the soil may be in excess of the sorption sites on minerals in the soil that are measured as iron and aluminum. Any number that's greater than zero indicates that that soil has a capacity to store more phosph phosphate, to sorb more phosphorus. There's available binding sites on iron and aluminum for phosphate to stick to. So out of the 63 samples that we collected at Forder Bridge, only two had negative numbers. And one of those was right smack dab next to the Maumee River. So like maybe not even part of the site. Um, so that's really promising. That's an early promising indicator that the soils in this site do have capacity to store phosphorus and prevent it from moving downstream. All right, so I mentioned earlier that we're also really interested not only in understanding what's entering and leaving the wetland in the water, but uh, the dynamics that plants can play, the role that plants can play in storing nutrients. So Ewan Isherwood and Lauren Brown with Helen Michaels and Kevin McClooney at Bowling Green State University are leading up our vegetation sampling crew. Um, and they are doing the hard work of going to each of these dots on the map, putting down a quadrat, counting up all the plants in it, um, and identifying them and taking subsamples of the plant tissue to measure the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus in those tissues so that we can estimate how much nitrogen and phosphorus is actually stored in biomass of different kinds of plants. Closely paired with this, um, we're exciting to share, excited to share is the use of drones to detect the spectral properties of the plants growing at a site over time at high spatial resolution. So Shay Ogandeji with Ricky Becker at the University of Toledo is leading this. Um, this is a drone image from Forder Bridge that was taken. When we combine data from these two different sources, um, Shay we are, is training computers to recognize plants in the drone imagery. So this is our first an early example of being able to map at high spatial resolution the dominant vegetation in different places in a site. So theoretically, we will be able to take the estimate of, say, for example, total phosphorus in a cattail stem uh, per acre, multiply it by the total area of cattails as detected through drone photography and estimate the amount of nutrients stored in those vegetation beyond the places where we have the capacity to directly sample vegetation because it's an incredibly time intensive um, activity. We're also using soil geochemistry to understand the properties of the soil um, and it detects potential groundwater interactions and informs our hydrologic models. This is led by Hannah Lapointe with Kennedy Doro at the University of Toledo. Um, importantly, we are installing integrated sensor networks. Um, these sensors are critical for helping us understand how connected wetlands are to the landscape. Sensors can be there when we can't. Sensors can be there all the time. They can detect the storm event or the drying event that doesn't um, check our outlook calendars for when we can go and take samples. So Zach Swan is working closely with um, partners at Limnotech and the Cleveland Water Alliance to design and deploy um, integrated sensor networks. Unfortunately, COVID-related supply chain issues have delayed our installation, but we finally got our first sensor system deployed at a coastal site, McGee Marsh Turtle Creek, last week. So we're really excited to start working on this. Um, one really important data synthesis tool that we'll be using is a 3D hydrodynamic modeling using the hydrogeosphere model. So in select sites, Gan Ming Liu and his team is going to build detailed hydrodynamic models that will calculate accurate water balances for nutrient budgeting, including 
um, reactions with groundwater, which is really tricky to get without models like this, um, and also help us understand in really detailed ways how hydrology shapes the wetland and the function of the wetland. Um, we haven't built this model yet for Forder Bridge, but here's a mock-up of the um, structure of the model developed for a different H2 Ohio project, the Brooks Park Wetland Creation and Water Quality Initiative near Buckeye Lake. Um, and I'm excited to announce that Dr. Liu also got some additional support from the Ohio Department of Higher Education HABRI initiative to not only use these models to calculate water balances, but to run the run different kinds of hydrologic scenarios to assess their impacts on nutrient function. This can help us guide things like um, how to design the hydrology of wetlands in the future, how to manage wetlands where we have control over pumps and water level control structures and things like that. Um, so this is going to be a really powerful tool in the systems where we have the bandwidth to build it. So putting it all together, I just Honestly, I didn't even talk about all the things that we're measuring in all of the wetlands at various degrees. Um, and that's just because wetlands are complicated systems. We're going to take all of these different data types and synthesize them, along with all the information that we glean, um, details about mechanisms, details about seasonality. Um, ultimately, our main goal is to estimate full nutrient budgets at annual scales. But what that means at an annual scale is that one year, all of that is gonna result in one data point for each project, right? The holy grail is the one very important, very powerful data point. So we might end up in 2022 with an estimate of the amount of phosphorus that Florida Bridge cleaned up out of that tile drain water that flowed through it. And because of data gaps, because of supply chain disruptions, that might be an estimate with quite a lot of uncertainty. But as we continue to monitor these systems year after year, we'll not only detect year-to-year -year variation, we'll also improve our ability to effectively monitor the system and that uncertainty should be reduced over time. Um, in addition, remember that this is just one of 113 projects. And so we realize that the amount of work that I just described in Forder Bridge, it's never gonna be realistic to employ that in wetlands throughout the state. Currently, we call those focal projects. We have about six intensively monitored focal projects where we're throwing everything we can at them to try to get the most, um, the best estimate of the nutrient budget as we can. In other projects, we're employing less frequent, less intensive sampling um, to develop low cost indicators of nutrient function. We're really watching out for red flags like high phosphorus concentrations that might indicate phosphorus release. Um, and through these efforts, we're learning how to basically take a wetlands vital sign. So we're hoping to um, develop indicators that are really meaningful snapshots of how a wetland might be removing nutrients in the same way that taking your temperature is a meaningful snapshot of your health to your doctor, um, but it doesn't really tell you what might be making you sick. A really important and exciting new direction that's going to expand our capacity to develop these vital signs is a new um, grant new support from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, focus area three, um, to expand our sensor infrastructure and capacity. Um, we've been awarded a $3 million grant um, to leverage our existing efforts um, through the monitoring program to purchase more sensors and expand our capacity to install them and process and analyze the vast quantity of data that the sensors will um, be giving us. This is going to let us validate these low-cost distributed sensor networks and hopefully develop tools for best practices in wetland monitoring, not only directly assessing individual wetlands, but allowing us to synthesize across different systems. The focus will be on projects in Allen, Defiance, Henry, Lucas, and Putnam counties to align with the GRLRI goals of the Maumee Basin and the western basin of Lake Erie. Now you might be thinking that we are going to be generating and already have generated a lot of data and you are right. Um, and you may be wondering, will I be able to see that data? And the answer is yes. Our goal is to make all of our verified and usable data readily available to researchers and relevant data products available to stakeholders. 
Um, but that means we have a lot of work to do to make sure that our data is rigorous, of high quality, and we can get to it and find the data we need when we need it. Aisa Mendoza, our data manager, is basically building from the ground up a bespoke database and data repository and data collection system in collaboration with um, people from Ohio State's Computer Science and Engineering Department and Translational Data Analytics Institute. Um, and we're working towards that final goal. Um, just like we're working towards the final goal throughout all of this. So the, no one has ever implemented a monitoring program like this for nutrients before. There isn't a manual that we could pick up. But we also don't want to miss the opportunity to collect data and information about restoration projects now as they are being built so we can track them as they change into the future. So we're boldly um, learning by doing with by embracing sort of an adaptive cycle. And whenever something's a cycle, it's hard to know where to begin. So I'll just orient you. You are here in the report progress and communicate results box. We are still in the middle of but nearing the end of our first field season of routine monitoring where we implement the monitoring plans that we wrote in the spring. We're furiously compiling and synthesizing data. Um, and we will continue to do this into the fall. Um, and in January, we will all gather in person, fingers crossed, in Columbus for our annual All Hands Workshop, where we will have a lot of FaceTime and intentional evaluation of our progress, um, revisiting our goals, redefining our objectives. And we'll do this every year. The main products that come out of these are our project-specific monitoring plans that I mentioned earlier and our program-wide monitoring plan, which outlines our policies and our framework that applies to the whole program. We're working on updating our 2022 version of that right now, and that's where you'll be able to find more details than what I'm sharing here um, when it's released. You might be thinking that this is a lot of people and a lot of things to coordinate, and you are right. And that is why Olivia Johnson, our excellent research coordinator, deserves another round of applause if you already applauded her once earlier. All right, I just wanted to zoom out because I, I shared some preliminary data about the Forder Bridge project. Um, but it's it's really just kind of it's a it's a small nugget of what we've accomplished throughout the entire program and even what I share with you here is a small nugget. We've collected over 1300 water samples from 34 wetlands and 500 soil samples from 34 wetlands so you might notice that's even more wetlands than have been completed so we've um, in places where it's relevant where we have the capacity we're collecting pre construction sampling to understand how the land is prior to being restored. We're, we've surveyed plant life in 11 wetlands and collected more than 800 samples of plant biomass. We've begun studying the mechanisms of how nutrients move between soil and water. Um, and this, this is a huge win. And I think the number is higher than this now. We've really expanded our capacity and built a really strong team by hiring more than 23 technicians and students. Um, and this has let us collect some really important foundational baseline data and build our capacity. I want to give a special shout out to the students. Um, each one of these 42 names, and there may be others at universities that I'm not aware of that have either done a research project or are doing a research project or are working as a, as a technician um, to help us with our monitoring at these universities. Um, this is such a fantastic opportunity to train people in wetland science and wetland research and all aspects of it, um, the opportunity to network with un universities throughout the state, with conservation partners, with agency personnel. Um, it's just a it's a it's a really great framework for enhancing the state's capacity to do this kind of work. And if you are a student interested in doing wetland research, contact me or one of the other PIs on the project because we have no shortage of field sites and background data to share with you. Uh, I mentioned the project partners earlier. Um, I, I also can't sort of underestimate the, the value of all of the conversations and relationships we've built with the individuals who have um, designed and implemented and own and are managing these projects. 
They share uh, information about the history, the goals, and the designs of each site. They help us with logistical support and site access. They give us detailed information about site management that is actually really important data for us, um, like um, in coastal wetlands when water levels are changed. Um, and we learn so much from, from all of you. I know that a lot of you are on the call right now. Hello. We've had great conversations about wetland conservation, restoration, and management generally. Um, and soon we are going to be working on guidance for partners who are interested in using some of our techniques or our frameworks to monitor non H2O Ohio projects that are not in our um, scope. Um, and so stay tuned for that. That's something that's in development. Um, we're also excited. We're starting to build up the capacity to invite anybody to help us collect data, um, especially community members, volunteers, student groups. Many of the sites have chronolog stations, which are places where you basically can put your smartphone up on like this little thing and take a picture. And if you go to the chronolog website, you'll see that the photos are stored there and you can watch a site change over time in terms of the phenology of the site, how it changes through the seasons. And also because these are restoration sites, we'll be able to see how the plant communities develop over time in those cases. Um, and then we're also starting to deploy crowd hydrology stations, which empower anybody walking by um, a, a gauge with a cell phone to um, tell us how deep the water is. So especially when we can't get sensors out in a site, um, having these crowd hydrology stream gauges out is, are going to help us be eyeballs on the ground and then also contribute to a national network of hydrology data. So we have one of these installed right now at the Sandusky River Headwaters Preserve and we're excited to install more of these um, at H2Ohio projects throughout. Um, and I also want to add that we're, we're working on engaging with community and student groups now. We're kind of building our programs for that. So stay tuned for more opportunities for community and student involvement in helping us monitor wetlands. All right, um, I know that many people probably logged into this webinar um, with the question of, are these wetlands working or not? Um, and I shared with you some of the reasons why we can't fully answer that question yet. We have some promising early preliminary data. So um, the scientist in me um, was compelled to frustratingly, for many of you maybe, uh, end the presentation with a question rather than a result. Um, to remind everybody that we're, trying our best to build a strong foundation to answer these questions to support science-based decision-making. Um, hopefully by the end of this, or as we collect more and more data, our answers to these questions will be refined about how effective wetland restoration is compared to other best management practices, considering the costs of different wetland restoration approaches to mitigating nutrient loads to water bodies in Ohio, um, and then I'm confident we're going to learn a lot of lessons to improve the effectiveness of how we design and implement and manage restoration wetlands into the future. Um, thanks again to all the conservation partners, collaborators, friends. There's many individuals with you know, deep and loose ties to the network who have helped us um, solve a lot of fun and interesting challenges. Thank you to all of you. Thanks to the Ohio Department of Education. Uh, higher education and the uh, GLRI for their new funding and special and a special thanks to the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. It's um, really remarkable that not only is the state investing um, such a, a robust financial support in improving water quality, um, but they also are invested in um, effectiveness and making sure it's based on the best available science and um, accountability. And we're really, really grateful for this opportunity to not only help address the ODNR's questions and the state's needs, um, but also expand our understanding of how wetland restoration works and hopefully can be an effective component of nutrient load mitigation. So if you have any questions, you may email me about the monitoring program. Lauren, <clears throat> thank you for that. We only have about seven minutes before we bump into the end of this. So I do want to call attention to um, all the 
the great links that were just play, placed into the chat function by Janice Kearns. So if you have questions about the monitoring plan, uh, the overview, we have a, a two-page overview that's listed here. So have a lot of questions we're not going to get to today. <clears throat> Reference these websites. Um, I would call your attention to the last one in there that is the LEARN website, so the Lake Erie and Aquatic Research Network, so the collaboration of academics doing this work. Um, that website is up and running. It's in its infancy, so we are working out some, some, uh, some adding details and, and nuances to that website. I will come to a couple of the real-time questions here, and then I think after we ask a couple of these, I might rattle just real quickly through some of the ones submitted online because I think they can be really quick answers. Um, coming to... Um, Dion at University of Cincinnati. So regarding the soil storage capacity of the data you showed on phosphorus, are these data determined at thermodynamic equilibrium and does the retaining of the phosphorus in flow through conditions operate at non equilibrium conditions? Yeah, that's a really good question. So that, that index is essentially based on more traditional phosphate sorption indices. So it's it's not an actual measure of the rate of sorption or desorption or, or any kind of kinetics behind that. They're mostly based on empirical relationships between um, sorption assays and iron and aluminum content, specifically the content of poorly crystalline iron and aluminum oxides. So that's why we're always really careful to say that it's an indicator and it, it, it gives us the capacity. Um, we'll only know if these soils are actually removing phosphate or actually releasing phosphate by studying how they function in the system. Um, one thing I didn't get to mention in here is in select systems, we're also using intact core incubations to um, as another way of estimating the amount of exchange between soils and surface waters of nutrients. And we're also deploying um, resins in soils to measure that in situ as well. Thanks, Lauren. I'm going to hop right into another one. Ruth Breland from you, or so Ohio EPA. So is there focus on the function of wetlands in Maumee watershed during its critical season, meaning that one March to end of July when phosphorus loading is linked to the HABs in the Western Lake Erie? 100%. That's one of the reasons why, you know, our aim is to get at annual loads, but we know that we have to sample those critical times to get an accurate annual load. Um, and that we're also going to be using that information to better understand the seasonalities of outputs and inputs. Um, Real, realistically, a lot of these wetlands are pretty far upstream of Lake Erie, so we'll have to kind of think about the context of what we do with all that information, depending on the location of the wetland in the watershed. Thanks, Lauren. And, and this one, I think you can answer it, but also, Janice, if you're prepared to unmute. So uh, mentioned sharing the dates from Forder Bridge case study because it was completed early. Were sites prioritized for monitoring, number one? And yep. was there a screening process to anticipate which wetlands would be more likely to retain P? Yeah, so I can answer the first one and Janice could answer the second one. Um, the sites were prioritized for monitoring, but not based on any assumption of their effectiveness. They were prioritized based on sort of logistics in terms of our their geographic location relative to researchers and um, the strength of relationship with partners in terms of our ability to get good information to guide our monitoring early on. Um, and then beyond that, we chose ones that at least in that early list of 26 sites were representative of, you know, broad suites of restoration approaches. So we have one coastal site. Um, we have one site that is relatively isolated. We basically tried to pick ones that we thought if we targeted just those six, they would have enough overlap with all of the other wetlands that we would be able to uh, take lessons learned from those six and make assumptions about other projects. Um, and that could change. That's one of the things we'll discuss every year at our annual workshop is do we wanna keep these six focal sites? Do we have the capacity to add more? Do we want to rotate them? Once we build some of these models, we can scale down our active monitoring and kind of keep a focal site without all the work and add on more. So ultimately, that's kind of where we're going. Janice, I see you turned on your video, please. Yeah, and I'll just say really quickly um, that the initial sites, specifically like things like Porter Bridge, along with any of the phase ones or the initial projects, 
primarily relied, you know, uh, occurring in the Western Basin um, of Lake Erie. It was always going to be a statewide um, initiative, but focusing on shovel-ready projects um, in areas that we knew that had uh, specifically areas of high nutrient levels, um, and so focusing on that Western Basin. Um, as we've developed uh, the program, the, the characteristics and how we're um, weeding out or selecting specific projects that's changed over time. Uh, Eric Soss, who is the uh, overall uh, lead for um, looking at all those projects is the best person to ask those kinds of questions. And uh, you could reach him through that H2 Ohio email address I included in the chat. Thanks for that. And I'm gonna come back. Uh, Sandy Bin with the Lake Air Water Keepers has too, but I think I can hit him while asking him. So our changing, our, how are changing now de decreasing water levels impacting these studies? So the first one is the change is TBD. I will say the lake levels are down now, but every climate model predicts that we're going to see more rainfall in the spring and the fall, heavier snow in the winter, and drier conditions in the summer. So that will all be seen. And this is why we're unable to give you know results right now in the take-home messages, because we need to see multiple seasons of wet and dry years. But yes, the lake levels are coming down, but the forecast for this part, the climate predictions for this part of the country is, is a wetter condition. And then Sandy had asked also a question about, she was puzzled that this group's wetlands are disconnected. And I think that was a, a maybe mishearing that. The wetlands aren't disconnected from the watershed. What we are finding is that when you do have dry years, pools that you thought would have flow through water or access to groundwater don't always have that access. So it's one of the things we're learning as we pick these wetlands and we study them, we want to find ones that have possibly higher connection, even in drought conditions. Uh, Lauren or, or Janice correct those comments or, or is that is that accurate? That's accurate. I would say that, you know, we have, I, I, I put isolated in quotes because we do have some, there are some H2 Ohio projects that don't have conspicuous stream inputs and outputs, but we know they're not isolated. We know that the best available science um, shows that, you know, all wetlands on the landscape are connected to the landscape and in, in many ways, even if it's not over. And so that's one of the reasons we're implementing. I wasn't able to get into a lot of detail about our groundwater monitoring, but especially at sites that lack those obvious surface water connections, we're prioritizing installing groundwater wells to understand their connection with groundwater and the role they could be playing in cleaning up nutrients that way. And then I'll just, there's one more that came in from Jim Spetz from Medina, just asking about the role of woody plants. But there was also a question submitted earlier online about using like prairie plants. I would say that these are new, nuanced questions. As you heard from Lauren's talk, we are looking at what nutrients are drawn up by plants that are in these wetlands. But as far as like doing research to identify, should we be planting different plants that don't just normally show up? We are working hard. The PIs are working hard to find supplemental funding through GLRI or the Ohio Department of Higher Education to ask those more nuanced questions. So prairie plants are on our radar, woody plants are on the radar, but given the, the scope of what we have on our plate right now, they're, they're just not there right now. I see we're one minute past our time here. I did put, there was a question that came in that somebody wanted to know what the levels of nitrogen and phosphorus inputs to the Great Lakes were, specifically Lake Erie. So I put in the nutrient mass balance study that Ohio EPA has done. And again, we'll put in right now, although it's already in there, the LEARN website. If you're interested as an academic, even just as an interested party, an elected official and agency personnel, check out the LEARN website. We do have our board meeting coming up in a couple of days that we're gonna add some bells and whistles to that website, but it's a good gateway into figuring out how you might get engaged, not only in this wetland monitoring effort, but in many collaborative efforts that we heard, that we hope this network will, will grow into. With that, Janice or Lauren, any final words? Again, it's 102, we're a little over time. No, thanks everyone. Yeah, I just wanted to, to thank everyone. Uh, I can't uh, say enough how much of a great team this is to work with. Um, it's it's rare that you get this many of individuals and researchers together in one place, and, and they work so well to get information done so quickly um, uh, across a, a very large landscape. So thank you very much for all of that. Um, and please feel free to contact any of us if you guys have any questions after this presentation.
Yeah, and Dr. Bob Minton answered a great clarification on what we call, you know, isolated uh, wetlands. And so please look at that description just added in there. But yeah, um, and again, a lot of these questions that were submitted prior to the webinar were really quick answers. So I'm going to see if I can get some of these posted where folks, folks can see them. I've answered most of them already. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Janice. Thank, Thank you, you Governor, for the H2 Ohio program. Thank you, DNR staff, for guiding this process. It's been it's been great. Take care, everybody. Enjoy your what is it, Wednesday? Hmm. Yeah. Enjoy your Wednesday. Thanks, everybody.